Did you know that as an Agile coach, we are bound by a code of ethics? That's right. We have a code for professional conduct and integrity and ethics that regulates our profession. The initiative is somewhat new. It has not been many years that it's out there. And it was codified by a group of amazing coaches in the Agile Alliance. So this initiative can be found in the link here down below. And I figured in today's video, let's look into why a code of ethics, what does that look like? And see how we really live all that good stuff of ethics in our careers, in our day-to-day -day as Agile coaches. So let's get started. So why ethics? What's the importance of it? Well, first, it's basically about regulating the behavior, the, the integrity, the accountability, and the level of professional commitment. Most careers, they have some order or a college that they are attached to that will help them and regulate that with a code of conduct and their own code of ethics from doctors to engineers, etc. So as a coach, you would have that as well if you are an ICF coach, for example, like I am. But Agile coaching specifically was missing that. So I'm really excited that, in a, you know, it's been a few years that the Agile Alliance put that initiative forward. And it is a great, great body of ethics for us to follow. The other thing I guess I would mention is that basically having a code of ethics just gives a very high standard for what is expected of the profession of an Agile coach. And to be very honest, it will help you in those very difficult cases and in gray areas in your career when you might have a dispute with your client or you might have something that you feel in your heart that, wow, this, is, this doesn't seem right. And you actually will be able to use your code of ethics to back you up in those situations where you don't want to, um, uh, to act in a particular way that is not respectful, is not professional, and doesn't abide to, um, by our code of ethics. And um, Honestly, I think any sort of code of ethics, and in particular the Agile Code um, of Conduct, the Agile Coaching Code of Ethics with Agile Alliance, just makes you be a better coach. So to have an idea on how much that can help you, let's take a look into the whole thing together today. As you scroll over the page, you're going to notice a few things. First, you're going to see the nine areas uh, that the code of conduct covers, and we're going to look into all of them in this video together. Then you're going to see the acknowledgement that Agile Alliance lets you know that they didn't create this from the void. They actually are inspired by other similar code of ethics, which totally makes sense. And like I said, if you are an ICF coach like me, you're going to feel right at home. It is heavily inspired by it. You're going to notice a lot of similarities. But the thing you're going to find on the page that is really interesting, if you continue to scroll down, is the scenarios. And if you have taken the course with me, the Agile Coaching Program, you have gone through these and other scenarios because we want to see the code of ethics in practice. It's not about memorizing what ethics should look like. It's really understanding in practice what are the boundaries of your responsibilities, of your accountabilities, and the things that you should say and do or not with your client. So that is really, really helpful. It's expected for you to keep a high standard as a Nigel coach. And I would say this, maybe you are not a certified Agile coach yet. I know I wasn't for many years, but I was still consuming everything that I could as far as knowledge for coaching and how to behave as a great coach and the things that I, I should know and learn. And I was already using, in that case uh, back then, the ICF standard. So even if you are now an Agile coach that is not certified, maybe you don't have the money to certify it just yet, or you're just in the beginning and you want to see if you really appreciate the profession in practice, I think looking into the code of ethics will be such a great way for you to already show up very professionally and understand the do's and don'ts of the profession as you go along. So let's look into the first ethical commitment and it's about confidentiality and intellectual property. And as you can imagine, what does that all mean? There's a lot of nuance as everything that I'm gonna cover here today, but basically it just says that you are bound by confidentiality. Does that mean that you cannot mention anything about any client? Well, 
you can, you're going to see in some of my videos in here that I mentioned things that happens between me and clients, but I will never name the client and I would never name anything very specific that would give away who that client, be it an organization or an individual was. So that is really, really important as you can imagine. And so is intellectual property. There are things that you might come in and that are tools and things that you do. And there are other things that you might be building, co-creating with your clients. So just a little bit of a guideline in there to, to keep the boundaries very clear and make sure that you agree with your client what those things look like. So if you have your agile health check for teams, for example, that continues to be yours, but make sure that is something that is very clear in your contract with the client as well. Otherwise they might be thinking, hey, you created that for us. It is now our intellectual property. So it's basically making sure that you, you, you draw the lines for things like that. And there is a legal piece in there as well. And I think it's something that, uh, you know, sometimes we forget as agile coaches, we go through organizations that are doing massive transformation. You get access to information sometimes that, you know, it's highly sensitive. So it's just a, just to keep that in the back of your mind as a reminder, you're going to, you're going to encounter more things than you should be discussing about and not with everybody, but also noticing that you have things that you discuss with an individual and you don't necessarily fully disclose to, let's say, their uh, their manager, unless it's previously clearly stated and agreed beforehand. So you want to make sure that you understand, you know, what can be shared across teams and managers and individuals before you go sharing the details of those conversations. The second one I really love, it calls us to the core of our integrity, which is the one acting within my ability. What does that mean in practice? Well, you, as, especially as a beginner agile coach, I mean, nothing prevents you from waking up today and declaring to the world, I am an agile coach, and that is awesome. But there probably are things that you then are not comfortable with. There's maybe a technique, there is a framework, there is a whole situation. Maybe you're not skilled in navigating conflict. Maybe the team needs a technical coach and you don't even come from technology. So when you detect these things, you have to ask yourself, am I within my ability to really be helpful in here? And then you have a few options. You don't really necessarily need to just get out of the way, but you would be plainly open with your client and say, well, this doesn't really fall into the category of things that I really am solidly knowledgeable about. And then see if together you want to find a way or you might be maybe collaborating with another coach that comes in and fills in the gap that you have or maybe handing over let's say, uh, so for example, even when you're coaching someone in a one-on-one -on -one and you might have detected that uh, there are certain things that should be, you know, oh, I thought the coaching was all about you becoming a product owner. And now you're detecting things that maybe have to do with anxiety, burnout, and all the things that usually more qualified healthcare professionals, such as the psychologist would be someone who should be helping that person. You would then mention that and you make sure that that person has everything that they need. And that is probably not the area of expertise where you can really make ground with that person. So it's really important to understand and detect those, those gaps, mention them, and really follow through into giving an alternative to your client. So as an agile coach, you are not, like we say in French, a passe partout. You really can to do everything for everybody. You most likely especially in the beginning, maybe 10 years down the line, you have a, a huge palette of experience, you know, so many cases, so many scenarios that you covered, but especially in the beginning or even 10 years down the line, doesn't really matter. As soon as you detect that there is a gap and that you're not the most appropriate help, it's time to activate this ethical clause. Clause number three is simple, is are you continuing to develop yourself? So agile coaching is not a set of disciplines fixed in time and space. It keeps evolving. The areas in which we can support the techniques, everything just keeps changing actually at quite a speedy pace. So are you part of communities of practice? You know, we have the lab of all things agile, which is free. We have events, we have uh, Q and A's. Uh, are you taking courses? Are you reading books? Are you coming back from your coaching assignment and reserving some alone time to really think through, 
and figure out like, well, here are the things that work really well, the things that didn't work, here's what I would do next. That kind of behavior is really expected of you. That's what this clause is all about. Clause number four is about conflict of interest. So you want to make sure that you're not letting anything that affect your objective thinking, your professional judgment, and is detrimental to your client and in particular beneficial for you. So for example, if like me, you give coaching and training, these are not the same things and these are not the same services. And I wouldn't be pushing for something that I know that is particularly um, a course that I offer, for example, even if my client doesn't need, there I am pushing to make sure that I, you know, I can, I can get that extra gig that is extremely unethical and that is a conflict of interest. Sometimes it can be that you have a tool or you're a partner with someone in an, in another company. So let's say I know the folks from Nitro and they have this amazing retrospective tool. And let's say I have referral fees from them and I can refer their tool to my client, but I need to be very transparent that I do get commission, that it's not just out of the goodness of my heart that I'm recommending their tool and not another another tool. So that is the sort of thing that comes into mind as well. You know, when you, when you refer, when you, when you sell services, think about everything that could potentially put your client at a disadvantage while you are benefiting from a situation. That is a clear sign that this clause needs to be activated. Number five is such a good one. And it's about the value of the relationship, this partnership between you and your client. It's not quite talked about. And I think I have a video where I share a story about that. And if I do, I'll post it here. And basically what this clause means is that you have the responsibility of noticing if you are no longer bringing value to your client. It is as simple as that. And it has to do with a few things. One, your client might not be the one who, even though they notice, they might not be the one who brings that conversation because, you know, it can be uncomfortable. But you should constantly be checking, assessing for, and noticing, and then asking your client, is this true? I'm, I'm noticing that we are no longer making progress, or for whatever reason, really, if you sense that the value is diminished, you should have that conversation. And it goes even Beyond that, this clause reminds us that the client is resourceful and we want to make sure that they can survive without us. So everything that you do, that you coach, that you teach, and that you facilitate for your client is supposed to be something that helps them not only move forward at that point in time, but also acquire new ways of doing and thinking so that they can do things without yourself. So it is actually normal and expected that the client will at some point find a diminished value in your services because they already reached a level in which, you know, you you are you could help, but you're not super necessary. And that is a good thing. That is also true even if you are an internal coach. It's not unnatural, it's not uncommon that you would eventually part ways with a specific team, with a specific group. It is desirable. It means that you achieved something and now it's time for the client to move forward. Or sometimes it will mean that, well, we didn't achieve exactly what we wanted, and I think you'd be better off by looking for an alternative. So it's a really important thing to think about. Don't be precious about keeping in your client. Of course, you wanna have excellent partnership and relationship with your client, but if you notice that things are not moving towards progress, that conversation needs to happen. That's what the clause number five is all about. Number six is just one that asks you to be a, a better human in general. But in the professional setting, what the social responsibility, diversity, and inclusion means? Well, it talks about make sure all voices are heard. It doesn't matter if you're noticing cultural differences. So how could you invite all these voices noticing that certain cultures could behave in different ways? Some are more verbose, some are more reserved. 
It could be you notice difference between a person who was more senior, always getting more of the everything, all the attention and, and all the insights, and the person who is maybe more junior is being disregarded. It really has to do with what is it that you are doing as a coach to equalize conversations, to create dialogue, and really making sure that at least from your part, you don't endorse, you don't condone, and you don't let any form of discrimination happen. Number seven, agreeing on boundaries. There's a lot of nuance in there. Well, the first one is when you come in as a coach, make sure that there are clear boundaries. You understand the mission, even if the mission is kind of like a moving target a little bit, but you're constantly renegotiating that and understanding this is the mission for the time being. Understand who is it that you can talk to, who is it that you're coaching, who is it that you're not, all that good stuff. That's the boundary piece. Another part that is important here is, and especially if like me, you came from the world of Scrum, you were a Scrum master before you became an Agile coach, make sure to listen. Forget about frameworks. The frameworks are nice. You probably know more frameworks than you need to use with a specific client in a specific moment. So the tools, the frameworks, they are really not important. Don't push for a solution just because it's your favorite, just because it's the one you worked with more. Remember that one about bringing value to your client. Remember the other ethical clause about working within boundaries of your ability. So maybe sometimes you're going to notice that the mission or the framework needed is not something that you may have the knowledge, activate the other two clauses. So you have to really be very consistent, be very much in integrity here. And that includes the final piece in, in agreeing on boundaries. It's remembering that you were an agile coach. There are many types of coaches. There is professional executive coach, there is business coach, you are an agile coach. So don't let all that uh, blabber that happens in social media sometimes that, you know, agile manifesto, yay or nay. Like, we are talking agile and the manifesto is definitely where we gauge a lot of what we do. You might not be exactly in those words, but for example, when you notice that a client is all about constant delivery, frequent delivery, that sounds very agile, but then they are burning out their teams and they are skimping on quality. Well, last time I checked, some of the other principles that this client seems to be forgetting is that we abide by technical excellence in that we develop things in a sustainable pace. So you can't just be picking apart your favorite principle or your favorite agile value and call this agile. As an agile coach, you come bringing that holistic view, that full picture painted for your client. Maybe they didn't know about this element, like I didn't know I shouldn't be burning out my people, or maybe they knew and they're just resisting that element, but that is what the profession calls for. You come in to help them be more agile, more flexible under the lights of those things that we know today. So we know you're not going to get anywhere delivering five times a day with poor quality and with a team that's burning out. So the conversations are difficult, but that's where your integrity as a Najo coach will be called into action. Number eight is about the difference in, in status and power, and it has two sides to it. So one is that you will probably be the one noticing when someone else that is influential or important is standing in the way of the mission that you were supposed to help your client accomplish. So those conversations need to be, to be had. You are not necessarily the person who can fix anything, but you are definitely a person that can create awareness in the room and start the conversations about that manager that is constantly undermining initiatives or, you know, someone who never really collaborates or even join forces against whatever, you know, there's always a contrarian in somewhere in the organization and understanding who is that person, where they come from, what can be done so that we can move forward. This is really important. But so is the other way around. Make sure that you are not the one influencing and getting personal gain. And sometimes the lines can get blurred especially my friend, if you are an internal coach, my heart goes out to you. It's really harder because you are in the machine of promotions and how career development happen in your organization. 
Yet at the same time, you need to make sure that you're acting with integrity. So for example, you wouldn't be withholding something so that a client cannot advance. And then later on, you can bring in that solution so that you're like the hero and then you save the day, you know, or you were the only person who can talk to someone because of personal connections, things like that. So you really want to be very attentive. And in my experience, having been an internal agile coach, I feel like it is much harder when we are internal coaches than, than external or, or consultants. So pay attention to that. Number nine, it's really about you walking the talk and being a respectful professional agile coach. So you are responsible for the reputation of the profession. Whether you are certified or not, how you conduct yourself, how you're able to bring dialogue, how you're able to suspend judgment and be there and serve your clients, Every single thing that you do, it's not just about you as a coach. It's about you representing a body of coaches out there. So bear your badge with a little bit more of a heavy weight because everything that you do that is amazing, it's being recognized as the work of an agile coach. Everything that you do that is a misstep is also being recognized as something that agile coaches do. So you have to remember you represent something beyond yourself once you embark on the journey of calling yourself an Agile coach. So there you have my friend, the Agile Coaching Code of Ethics. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you're interested in maybe a deeper dive in one of the nine clauses, let me know in the comment section down below. Or if you have any other question related to the subject, it would be my pleasure to answer. As for today, this video is already quite long, so I'll end it here and I'll catch you on the next one. Bye for now.